almost every program that we've run from community labs to the relational learning cohort. I see the senior educators cohort. I see design of immersive experiences. I see um, consulting opportunities and projects that we've worked with partners. I see board members. I see members of the broader field all in just like a screen is really remarkable. So, um, so thank you for coming and for everyone for kind of playing in this really nice jigsaw puzzle. Um, I want to also introduce you to Haley. Um, Haley from M Squared, who is really like the, the life behind everything in the organization and just keeps us running and operating, and it will be very apparent on this, uh, on this session as well, um, as Haley is going to be controlling the, uh, the PowerPoint. So let's, uh, let's dive in, um, and Haley, if you don't mind starting the PowerPoint right now. The topic for today, um, just to make sure you're on the right plane, right? Our destination is facilitating group dynamics. Um, and we are going to be talking primarily about Bruce Tuckman's theory of group formation and um, you know, what is it, what are the different stages of group dynamics and, um, and how some of those stages can be facilitated both in person but also virtually. Um, when we don't have the uh, luxury of convening face to face, um, we are still, many of us, if not all of us, are in a position of either being part of groups or facilitating group dynamics. And there are certainly, there's a theory behind that process, and there are many theories, but we're going to go through one theory behind that process and um, get into some really granular tips for how to go ahead and do that. So. Um, a couple of rules as we're starting. Um, my rule of engagement here is I, I would like to ask for the right to call on people to read and instead of these open like volunteer looking for somebody, but I may call on you. With that, um, you completely have veto power. You could say pass, not interested, and that's fine. And everyone just accept that. Um, and that's okay. And secondly, you will all get a copy of these slides. There's a lot of information on these slides. Um, so don't expect to just copy it all down. Um, you will copy as well. So um, let's, uh, let's move to the next slide, Haley. Um, group dynamics, the word group means many, many, many different things. Um, and it can mean, uh, if for those of you who have not received the M squared value sparks, the one that was released yesterday cannot be more timely for this conversation. Um, it's a values exploration about the value of community. And for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, go to the M squared website, ieje.org, and there's a section called Value Sparks, and there's one called Community. And in that, um, there's, a pro there's a text that um, has, is core to M squared, and I've taken on an even deeper um, place, which, uh, in which Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs describes three different types of communities and uses three different constructs, the third of which is kihila. Um, in Hebrew, that's what's the, the word for community, but in the way he describes it, it's different from the other two. It's a community that is actually working towards a shared goal. It's not a random group of people who find themselves in the same moment. It's not people who are interested in a topic like a webinar and sign up and may never see each other an hour later. It's a group that is coming together for um, a shared purpose over an extended period of time to work towards something. And ultimately, the result is better um, because of, of the group efforts um, individually and collectively. So as I'm defining group for this purpose and the way that Tuckman I truly believe describes the group process, I have Kihila in mind in the way that Sachs is describing Kihila, that is a group who has convened according to the following three criteria. Number one, there's an element of active participation. It's not I'm passively part of a group, but I'm actively involved and I do something. I'm a contributor to this. Number two, we are not just convening for the sake of convening, but the group is actually working towards a shared goal. And that shared goal can be as literal as we are trying to open a restaurant and therefore are assembling a team of cooks and wait staff and who knows what else to get to opening day. And it could be a shared goal of we are assembling a cohort and we're part of a cohort that's going on a joint learning experience together. But there is a shared purpose um, and, and kind of end goal in sight. And finally, there's an element of time. Um, there's a relationship that's cultivated over time and this group is not something that is, um, is is can be focused on in a singular moment but rather there's an, a notion of development so taking these three kind of um, defining characteristics of this type of group into account I would like for each of you to have a group experience in mind that you can apply the rest of this presentation towards um, and give it a real context in a container so what you should be thinking about is as follows try and identify for yourselves a group that you have either been a part of or facilitated, it doesn't matter, 
It could be one from 20 years ago, and it could be one that you're in the middle of right now. It doesn't matter. Um, and it could be one that um, it just has to meet these three things. So something like a project, like uh, on a project team, or you were the project lead, or a cohort experience, or a task force, or a manager, or a travel program, or um, a, it being a camp counselor, and any, it doesn't have to be the most significant group, but give yourself, go back into that space of being involved in a group. And when you are able to name it as something like Senior Educators Cohort 4, that's the group I have in mind, in the chat box, just write for everyone what the group is, just for yourselves. And also we can get more awareness of what are some of the groups that people have been involved in, even if it's not the most significant one. So, great. So as these are coming in, scroll through the different chats and see, kind of get to know that other dimension of other people. And if you haven't yet added in the chat, do this for yourself. I won't call on you for it, but this will only make the learning that much more applicable. Um, Haley, let's move to the next slide. So Tuckman, our good friend Tuckman, um, 1965 American um, psychological researcher. He really he develops this theory on group formation, group development, group formation, um, and it has four stages. Sometimes there's a fifth stage. Um, the fifth stage is like what happens when the group dismantles. So I'm not going into that part just yet. We're focusing on the first four right now. Um, and in very simple language, he gives a structure to to a process which is so complex and so intricate, and he really divides into four unique stages. Stage number one is forming, where a group comes together and it's an element of orienting to each other and to the task and really trying to figure out their role and their placement in what's happening. Um, and that happens for quite some time. And then there is the inevitable storming, which is something um, quite cathartic that he even named as being natural to the group formation process, but it's all the ugly and the icky and the uncomfortable where um, individuals and the group um, express resistance to what's happening to each other, to the task, to all the revolts that seem to occur. Um, and hopefully a group is able to get through the storm, really weather it and get through a stage of normalizing what's happening um, in the normal Forming stage, there's the sense of openness um, to each other. And then once that happens and there's a new appreciation for themselves and for others and for the task, then they're able to get into a really good state of flow and constructive action and they perform and they know each other and they know their place in the group and they're actually able to, to move forward. So it's these four stages. The best um, example that like if I had to give imagery to this and I, you know, I'm a, a geek for MasterChef, even though that logo looks like it kind of could be an M squared logo, but um, and <laughs> MasterChef on the bottom. Um, um, so the team challenges in MasterChef. So for those who don't know, it's the same as any reality kind of competition and TV show. What happens in it is you have home cooks that come together and they try and compete to be the best home cook in America, uh, Australia, whatever country it's taking place in. And, um, and through the process, they randomly have team challenges. And what happens in these team challenges is they say like, the five of you are coming together and you have to um, prepare dinner for all the firefighters in the city. And you've got one hour to do that. And what always happens in the beginning is they say, great, what do you want to do? And what do you think should be on the menu? And that sounds like a lovely idea, even though I know it's a terrible idea. And they say, fine, you go to whatever station you want to go at. And it's like literally the form that is classic forming. And and then what happens is they look at the clock and they're like, oh no, something is burning. We don't have enough time. The other group is doing so much better. Competition immediately takes over. They start breaking all rules. I'm, you're not the line chef anymore. I take, and then what happens is the team captain says, we have to stop. We can't continue anymore. Let's focus. Let's reassign the task. That's norming. And then in the end, um, they won because they put on the best, um, the, they delivered the best meal and they were able to come together. And the last three minutes of the competition, everyone knew what had to happen and they couldn't be prouder of, of what went on. That is like classic um, Tuckman in, in kind of looking at those four stages. So if you can have that in mind, it's giving the language to, you know, to, to the theory that happened. Haley, next slide. So this webinar, this session is a sprint through the four stages. Um, and 
it's really to give an overview to each of the stages, recognizing that we could have a separate session to go into each one of them. Um, so what we're gonna try and do is actually give some overview to what it is, what it looks like, how to facilitate it, but very much recognizing that there will probably be a part two or three for each of the, the stages, but this will give the overall picture of, of, of how everything fits together. So, um, so forming. So what happens in forming is the members become oriented to each other and to the task at hand. Um, and what happens in the stage is that they try they, they need to rely on the leader and they need to rely on each other and they're seeking the the rules of how this works and what place do I have in order to be dependent on myself and, and how should I act and what are the norms that are going on over here um, I'd like to ask um, Tova do you mind reading the, the the four lines that are in quotes on the top but you are on mute and you are now still on mute Sorry. Um, the hey, Hi. <laughs> the term testing refers to an attempt by group members to discover what interpersonal behaviors are acceptable in the group. In orienting to the task, one is essentially defining it by discovering its ground rules. Okay, so this quote, as no, just that, this quote and most of them um, that are in here come from the source that's on the previous slide, which is, you know, from Tuckman straight out of his writing, where he describes the idea that testing is one of the key um, uh, features of what happens in forming. And what I find most um, helpful about Tuckman's uh, kind of his description of it is it's testing in two completely different domains that are constantly at play throughout the entire group development process. It's testing who am I in the group interpersonally, socially, with you know dynamics of who's involved. And at the same time, it's what am I doing? What is being asked of me? What is the task? Am I successful? Am I doing what I should be doing? Am I pushing myself? Am I proud with what I'm doing? And there's, there, I'm constantly forming, orienting myself to the task and to each other. And those two things, will they're separate, but they're constantly intertwined throughout the entire group development process. Um, the more we can go through the four stages and also keep that distinction of, is the storming about you know, fight, inbreeding or fighting between the, the groups and the members of the groups, or is it like they're just so frustrated with the task at hand that they're just giving up? It, it allows us to facilitate that situation in a totally different light. So with this in mind of forming to each other and to the task, um, there are the same manifestations appear. We don't necessarily know what they're reflective of. We need to dig deep um, as, as facilitators to figure out why are they pushing boundaries? Why, why are my learners right now, why are the members of my group um, seeking role clarification? Is it for their own prominence within the group or is it because they genuinely don't know like, what they're supposed to be doing right now? So these are four common manifestations of what forming looks like in a group, um, where they're trying to establish credibility and position themselves. And I'm wondering if, if you know, everyone can take a minute to think about the context that you've written in the chat box and um, try and identify for yourself, um, were you able, did you experience any of these manifestations? In the early stages of the group getting together, can you think of an example of someone seeking role clarification or, or doing something to position themselves that, um, that kind of brings a little bit more life to this idea? And if so, I'm not going to call on you just yet, but I'll open it up for someone to unmute themselves and just give us an example. What does this look like in real life? Give us a little color. So we're, in, we're forming a hiring team made up of staff and volunteer leaders. And in the very beginning stages, that, that question about whose hire is this, who gets to say, um, you know, what are the qualities that we're looking for in this person? Um, how, are, how are we going to go about the hire? That all was the content of probably the first two meetings before mm -hmm. any action could actually take place. Wow. And as a result of those meetings, did you gain clarity? Like what, what, what happened by spending enough, a lot of time on that? So, so what happened was we did gain clarity um, and, and it kind of manifested in the, in the structure of the hiring process that we created mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, right. staff had this amount of input, leadership had this amount of input. Mm -hmm. 
That's yeah. great. Thank you, Adela. And hi, Adela. Adela's in the hi. relational learning cohort. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> so, um, so, so that's an example of facilitating a group and facilitating the forming is creating the conditions for it to happen kind of seamlessly and effectively. And there are other examples when a learner um, may find themselves in a group as a participant and, and they need to navigate it. Like I'm in a new place with a new group doing new things. I really need to figure, figure, um, figure it out. So Khani just wrote over here, participants in the online class either stayed quiet or began to talk first. Exactly. It's like, how, how do I, what are the rules? Can I interrupt? Do I need to be on mute? All of that is a, you know, in the early stages, trying to form and figure things out. So Haley, if you move to the next slide, um, I believe there are four um, needs, at least four needs, that participants have, which, it, which can be um, addressed in the way that we facilitate through the forming process. And those four needs can be found here in the yellow bolded text. Um, and that's where I'm going to start off. So participants in general need to know what's expected of them. And, and they also need to know what they can expect from us. It's a mutual um, arrangement over here and that anxiety over like, what, what am I even meant to be doing? What is this all about? And what contributions do I need to make? We need to address that and there are strategies for how to do that, but that is being figured out in the forming stage. Participants are always also looking for direction for how to act, maybe rules of behavior, but in this instance, like how do I participate online, which requires significantly more direction and instruction and framing than like any other rule of behavioral conduct that we would just accept as obvious and normal. So they're wondering like, what am I supposed to do? Exactly the example that Connie you know, shared in the chat. Um, participants also need to appreciate that their contribution has an added value, like that it matters that they're there, especially on a screen when they're hidden behind something else. Um, and I can only see however many are on my screen at a moment, they get lost and they need to know that they're, they need to be there and we value their contribution, not just as the leader, but the group itself among <laughs> that they value each other and they see relevance. Um, and then they also need to know what their position is within the group. And this is like figuring out, am I the leader? Am I the follower? Am I the collaborator? Am I the feedback giver? Like what, what, what can I play where I feel like I'm able to really tap into my strengths, provide a need and also be accepted among the group. Um, and I need the facilitator often to clarify that role um, or at least to at least make space for that role, um, ex the, the exploration of opportunities that I can play to, to map out. Um, one person can speak at a time in a webinar. It's not that side conversations are happening. And chat, as much as people want to use that as side chatter, the chat gets lost because Zoom for some reason hasn't figured out how to have an effective chat system. So there's like, there, there is not, a, there are very few opportunities for people to do this on their own and navigate these four needs that a lot of this is dependent on a facilitator. Um, so underneath, you know, the strategy to go ahead and do this or like the, the overall objective, the driving force would be the black bolded words on the top. And therefore, like, we need to create norms. We need to formulate the rules of engagement. As facilitators, we need to generate buy-in among our learners, and we have to clarify our roles. And those are there, are, there are many others, but I find these to be like the four key ingredients, at least in the forming stage. If we're able to do that and generate buy-in as one example, then it's likely that they will want to be there and be more invested in it. And the group will, the task and the developmental kind of group pieces will move forward. So underneath this, we have, you know, under each category, there are three bullets, three different tips of how we might be able to facilitate this way. There are infinite more. Um, and, and I don't come to, you know, claiming I'm an expert in virtual facilitation at all. I'm in full, you know, honesty, we're going through our own training on virtual facilitation. It's something new that we're all learning. Um, but there are a couple of tips that I'm able to share. And then I want to open it up and see if people can share, you know, maybe two or three others that aren't on this list. So one of them that speaks to me, I mentioned in terms of clarifying roles all the way on the bottom right, is just ensuring that everyone at every moment knows what is being asked of them. Um, it's not that you have the label of always being the top and always being the leader but in this breakout room we're going to have four people and I'm going to ask for the first person to do x and the second person to do y and just make sure that the instruction is clear the position is not just a hierarchical position but it's what am I meant to be doing <laughs> um, 
a tactic for doing that, if I go into column number two and I'm looking at the second bullet, one way, and this also, it's like the rules of engagement, I give, us, I give numbers to each participant and I assign them roles. So, you know, as people log in, I say, um, you know, Deb, I want you to rename yourself Deb Massey, number one. You know, and Adela, you're number two. And on your name tag, you have whatever number you are. And that becomes um, quite obvious. And, and, I, and I say one sit in the hot seats, two offer feedback, and then I can create my own rules for that to happen. Um, when it doesn't happen, then people just get lost and they don't know how the codes of conduct work. And these are the needs that we need to begin to address. Um, one last one that I want to point out is column number one, bullet point number two. More so than ever, learners want, they need that clarity over the rationale. Like, why are we doing this? Like, why mute? Why not mute? Why go on endless introductions? Why yes, go on endless introductions? Like, why are we doing what we are doing? And they need to see that instant gratification, the immediate purpose. So they're, they're able to orient themselves to each other, to the task, generate that buy-in, all of that is happening. Does anyone have either an idea of a bullet that does not appear here or something that does that you either want to amplify or give a new twist to? Open to anyone to unmute. Um, I'm, I'm curious, Kiva, if you have any Hi, thoughts. Hi, SD. SD hey. from SCC3, <laughs> hailing in from Club in Washington. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious if you have, like, th there's a certain um, element to group norms that are normally created based on what you can pick up about a person, you know, the way they're dressed, um, their age is often more apparent when you can see their whole body, their, their clothing impacts how you see them. And while um, you have a tiny drop of that in, um, on Zoom, you don't have those sort of social mm -hmm. cues. And I'm curious whether you can speak to mm -hmm. that a little bit um, as it relates For to sure. group norms. So the criteria of group, like going back to the criteria of a group, it's a group that's meeting on an ongoing basis or at least over a period of time. And one of the norms you might want to start off with is just saying, we're getting to know each other and we're going to be introducing new norms over a period of time and just grant yourself the luxury of not needing to make all calls final in the beginning, but to revisit right. and to add as you're starting to recognize new things. The second part about this, it goes to what I have here in bullet number one under the first column for norms, is one way of doing norms is starting off in a blank slate. What's important? Important to you? What do you think we need in the group? And it's easier to do that in person when you're actually like in a room able to facilitate that. You don't have that luxury right now, unless right. you're really good at using Mural and whatever other tools are out there. But for, assume not for the time being. And therefore, offer norms as a starting point. These are our norms. I want to open up one for a conversation. If anyone wants to, you know, discuss this offline with me, I have all the time in the world. But this time, face-to-face -face is valuable, and I would not spend it on just an open, endless come. People need right. direction. They need the direction in that instance. One more question or comment, um, and then we'll move on to the next slide. I mean, I, I typed in the chat box, Kiva, that, like, yeah. <laughs> I have so much of this that I, I mean, I, believe I facilitate, especially on on Zoom these days so so much, and I don't think to say like the rationale, we're putting you in groups of two or three because we want to make sure everybody has a chance to connect. And you know, like, mm -hmm. why am I, not, when like people get thrown into a Zoom room and they're like, are there more people coming in a breakout room? You know, why are there only two of us? You know, mm -hmm. and I real now you like pointing it out is like, aha, why don't I just spe specifically say mm -hmm. what the intention is? and help mm -hmm. them understand and the clarification is super helpful so thank you awesome thank you thank you deb massey from the bay area um, who convened a beautiful um, community cohort that m squared was a part of for teen educators good to see you again um so to that point um I, the, the second point related to what you said is the number of people in a breakout group that's in column two number, the last one it should never be in my opinion never more than four and i would even push for no more than three and what happens in um when you've got when you've got two people in a group, no one can escape. When you have three people in a group, everyone's looking at each other. And when you have four people in a group, it's easy to deflect on the others. And we, in order to like force participation, minimizing the group size will um, will allow that to happen. Um, cool. Keep, All right. Keep that, so yes. I just want to check on that because is that in the context of breakouts where there is not a facilitator? Uh, that is in the, yeah, yes, because the facilitator can control the engagement, meaning assuming the facilitator is mindful of just making sure yeah. everyone's involved, for sure, yeah. Um, 
And uh, yes, and, meaning, and it still shouldn't be one facilitator for 30 or 40 people because, or full cohort at all times because you can't get to everybody. <laughs> so. I have a question, Kiva, is that okay? Yes, Tova, of course. Um, so hey, I'm Tova just... from LA and two cohorts, SEC4 and Power in 2020 with our men. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I I'm curious about if the value that one is teaching and trying to cultivate is community, let's say, if that's like the actual value. How can you do, how can you do it online? Like I, I, I'm finding that what's missing and maybe you're going to go into this, this session, maybe it's a different session, but like the schmooze factor or that in between factor is like certainly missing in the virtual mm -hmm. sphere. And so I'm just curious mm -hmm. if there's been thought on that, if that's part of this. For sure. Yeah, for sure. It, it comes up when I'm going to speak a little bit about norming, but it applies here as well, is that when we think about virtual, um, it, it, there's on time and there's off time and off time can be on time as well. And the ways that you can encourage like, can, like group formation to continue that's unfacilitated. Um, it could be structured. It could be, we're asking you to pick up the phone and speak to someone in a group, you know, and go for a walk in the park as you do that right now and just talk about whatever it is. You're still controlling it by giving it a container, but it's, it's happening offline. Um, that's a key part to this as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Haley, let's move on to our favorite, the storm. <laughs> okay, so storming is, is just uncomfortable. Um, it's where members find themselves in conflict, the management of which becomes the focus, which means we are managing conflict. We are not managing our group. We are not managing the task. We are not, we've lost sight of what's going, we just like need to, what is going on here? I, I, this isn't working for me. And it just unleashes everything that's going on. Um, what emerges is antagonism, turmoil, like those are really the descriptors. Um, and we've all been there. <laughs> we've totally all been there. Um, Robin, can I ask you to read the quoted text, the three lines at the top? Hello, Robin from yeah, SEC, yeah. SEC3. Yes, hello. Hi, group members become hostile toward one another and toward a facilitator as a means of expressing their individuality and resisting the formation of group structure. Mm -hmm. So when we get into the storming, again, two very different things that are going on. The reason for storming or what it might be an expression of is really like, who am I? Do I matter? Am I noticed? Is my contribution whatever? Why am I putting up with like, like it's really about the me and trying to express who I am and what I can contribute and it's not being appreciated or utilized in the best way. And at the same time, like, resisting the formation of the group structure. I don't want that person to be the leader. That leader's a terrible person. Or why does that person get to present first right now? They're so annoying. <laughs> or, you know, all of these questions about myself and who I am and also like what is going on around me. And I just, I don't like what's happening to me and I don't like what's happening to them and I don't like them and everything just comes out at once. And that's the storm. And the best descriptor for it is what's listed in the way bottom of this slide. You want to run away. Like, you just want to get out. You we want to say, like, I need a break. I need to go home for the night. I need to just quit. I need to, like, depending on the severity of it, you just want to run away. And that's when you know you're in storm. When you don't run away, when you don't want to run away, but you feel like this is annoying and this is frustrating, that's, like, a bit of a conflict, but that's not a storm. The true storm, and this is the fascinating part, that Tuckman says a group has to go through, not might go through in forming a group, but actually has to go through in order to test themselves. The extent of their, um, their, their relationship with one each other and what their tolerance for each other and how they deal with themselves individually and among each other, all of that comes to the test in a storming stage and it has to actually be there. That is as complicated and, uh, and uncomfortable as it is that to um, see it and to facilitate it, kind of need to even foster it and, um, and, and support it, um, this conflict stage. And there's questions about how involved does the facilitator get in order to resolve conflict or help them get out of it. The shift in mindset of conflict, of, of storming is critical for the group formation process and people need to weather the storm in a way that they are able to have stronger confidence about their individuality and an acceptance to the group structure. That's when they've weathered it in a very effective way. Um, what does it look like? We all know what it feels like, but what you actually, what it looks like is like, there's no unity, there's fighting, there's issues that are polarizing the group. Like we can start naming what, we can give excuses to like, what is the root of the storming, but all in all, it's so much 
bigger than that and we kind of just want to to run away so i want you know to give a little bit more context to this manifestations of storming you know these get a little bit more um uh, we kind of run away from them and don't want to revisit them, but revisiting your actual context could be helpful for this. So I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes. Um, and if you want to turn off your camera because that's uncomfortable for you, you're welcome to, but at least close your eyes. We're going to do this for one minute. And just as your eyes are closed, go back to the context that you've given yourself. What group are you or were you a part of? And get into a moment of storming. Like just, just when did you want to run away? When was it so icky <laughs> you just you couldn't take a minute and just describe it to yourself go go relive that moment i'm sorry but just do it <laughs> Okay, so next week there's a session with SL. He can be your therapy for, for making me revisit <laughs> all the trauma. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, as you're revisiting this, um, and I'm not gonna call on anyone, like this is totally voluntary, but can you like, like this, like raise your hand if in your example you wanted to run away? I'm not asking you to describe it just yet, but like did you get to a point that you, you're able to, yes, like, recall that moment yeah just to the visual on the camera okay so some people are there some working on it okay you can put your hand down um and i'll give the opportunity but certainly won't force it if anyone wants to unmute themselves and just describe it um you don't have to implicate anyone by name or whatever what what was that moment like what was so icky about it daniel one, one minute, uh, you're on mute. And Hello. Can Hello, you Daniel. Me? You're good. Yes. <laughs> um, I was thinking about um, a time, uh, the group I'm thinking about is a, a, a team within my larger staff team uh, at Prisma. Um, a smaller team, but it's still like two thirds of the staff who are helping to design our big annual conference or biannual conference. And we were going on a tour of the hotel together and people were sort of pushing me as I was leading the group. And they were like, oh, we could do this and we could do that. And oh, why don't we eat here and all that. And it was, I was having sort of a very like, no, stop giving me your ideas. We've thought about these things through already. Um, and it was just a, an interesting, in the moment, it was very much, uh, I, I felt the tension in the room and I had a hard time dealing with the tension as the leader of the group. Uh, but afterwards, sort of thinking back about it, it was, it was interesting to think about the dynamics and how it mm -hmm. could have been managed differently. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Daniel. It's also interesting because in that, you know, oftentimes when we think of storming in group formation, we think like the, the learners are storming and I'm, I'm like a facilitator and an observer. And very often we get so caught up in that storm as well that we're storming to an extent with them, at them, about it, the task, like all the other things that are going on. It's, it's kind of hard to remove ourselves from it as well, which means um, by being in it, oftentimes it helps work through it, um, not only by facilitating from afar, but by saying like, you're in the middle of a program and you say, we're changing course. We're doing a course correction today. Like this, something didn't work. We need to, and this is why, and this is what we're going to do. And it's going to be uncomfortable. And we're just going to, those are the type of things that happen for the facilitator that might be necessary as well. Not just for the group, but based on where they were at that time. So if you go to the next slide, Haley, um, there's a, a wonderful author, um, Patrick Lencioni, who, who writes just very easy to read, captivating um, fictional stories, um, all about uh, different ideas so, like, uh, that have to do with team and with like business practice. So he's got one about meetings and how to run functional meetings. And this one over here is about the five dysfunctions of a team. It's this fictional story about um, a team that's totally dysfunctional and they bring in a new CEO and she whips them into shape and just gets them 
to perform, <laughs> um, to optimal performance. It's like, so she goes step, step by step. And there's a quote in here, which I really appreciate, which um, gives the right um, spin on conflict. When I say conflict, it's a loaded term. This is what we mean by conflict as articulated in the story. So um, I would like to ask Melinda, are you okay reading this? Thank you. Sure. If we don't trust one another, then we aren't going to engage in open, constructive, ideological conflict. And we'll just continue to preserve a sense of artificial harmony. You have tension, but there's almost no constructive conflict. Passive, sarcastic comments are not the kind of conflict I'm talking about. It's the lack of conflict that's a problem. Harmony itself is good, I suppose, if it comes as a result of working through issues constantly and cycling through conflict. But if it comes only as a result of people holding back their opinions and honest concerns, then it's a bad thing. I'd trade that false sense of harmony any day for a team's willingness to argue effectively about an issue and then walk away with no collateral damage. Thank you. So when we talk about storming and tension and conflict, some of it just emerges because of the group dynamics piece and even like frustration with the task. But there's also an opportunity here. And if we take what um, Tuckman is telling us to heart, that it's, it's, it's a necessary part of the group formation process. And therefore, we want to construct conflict. We want to we wanna craft the right opportunities for people to grapple with difficult ideas and to get irritable and to force them to make a position and to really you know, test the, their, their boundaries and everything that's going on. Like all of that, then we actually need to create conflict. And it's a bit counterintuitive. It's very in the mindset of the M squared culture for many of you who have gone through the programs. You'll, conflict is not so foreign. Um, but that last, those last couple of lines, like, um, you know, I trade the false sense of harmony any day, which that, that cheesy, we're all great and it's wonderful. But we know, you know, for a willing, team's willingness to argue effectively um, about an issue and walk away with no collateral damage, um, just to spotlight for a minute the work that Jake and Becky do um, at Bronfman, I think this is like a guiding uh, principle of the Bronfman Youth Fellowship, where, you know, it's get convening teams together to talk about real issues that matter um, and putting them in situations where it's not about walking away with a sense of harmony, but really walking away having duped it out in a really profound way um, speaking on your behalf but if you want to say yeah. more Becky <laughs> well well I mean I'll just I'll just add that I think this this is one of the things that when we early on decided that this year we're moving to a largely virtual group formation process um, it was one of the things that Jake and I feel anxious about is how do you um, bring some pro productive tension when in other times productive tension comes from living together comes from having to experience Shabbat together Certainly it comes around speakers with controversial ideas, but again, that's not, those things matter and those debates matter, but those aren't actually the places where it really, where it really gets tough. Um, and I, mm -hmm. I guess one of the things I'm still trying to better understand is, um, I 100% I agree with this quote, and I don't want people to hold back their opinions and honest concerns. And what I fear is that especially with online, it's much easier for people to back channel that and not bring it in, you know, in a public space um, or bring it in the group. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned about how to do that. I mean, again, there might be moments and we're gonna like go through this process and there might be moments mm -hmm. where we just see that people seem checked out or whatever. And it's gonna be on us as facilitators, even in a virtual setting, so mm -hmm. to speak, to do what we would have done in an in-person setting, which is push that and ask that and interrogate mm -hmm. that in the moment. But it might be harder mm -hmm. to do that um, or it'd be harder to identify yeah. it, even if you sense it. So I definitely, and I would go back to the forming stage, meaning because a lot of what you're describing stem from either the um, apprehensions or anxieties that they may be holding themselves back and might be able to be alleviated by addressing those four pieces that are there. Um, what are the rules of engagement? Why are we doing this? What happens when things get really icky? Our norms, we expect that you're gonna hold back and therefore we're gonna create a condition that you can't hold back, which means I will call on you. You cannot disappear. We're gonna have our, raise the stakes, make different ways to make people more visible and noticeable that they understand the rationale behind why they buy into it and they see themselves as valuable and important. That it's not, the way I see it, it's not dealing with conflict in the conflict, it's setting up the precursor so that conflict can emerge in a very productive way. 
Um, Haley, let's move to the next, the final slide about conflict, and then we'll move on to norming. So what does this look like in a virtual space? It's, this of all stages is no surprise, one of the more difficult ones to answer because there's the conflict is so circumstantial to the time and the place and the context. So I frame this more as questions to consider, like when you are dealing with conflict or, or even anticipating conflict, the questions on the left are things that I would, you know, among your team start thinking about. Like, does storming follow its normal course or is an intensity different online? Um, intensity or even sub, you know, substitute that word for something else. Is its prominence, is its, is its um, appearance different online? Um, what degree of facilitation does conflict resolution require in groups? Um, you know, sometimes we might want to let them weather it on their own, but maybe we need to be more involved in this instance simply because um, they don't have time offline or the time they have offline is just too value the time we have online is too valuable in order to let the conflict stay for that long um, and i also think about in what ways does conflict play itself out on a timeline differently uh, and that goes to that question as well like do i need to try and bring i don't know if resolution is the right word but um, at least working through the conflict in a quicker way, or at least if it's not worked through, facilitate it much more tightly so that people don't get lost in everything that the conflict and the storming bring along with it, but are able to be part of the storm and, and just know that they're noticed through this and that they're not crazy and you're helping them and there's a degree of facilitation as well um, that takes place on a different timeline. The, the, the tips, which, um, which I think are, you know, they may come off as a little bit like obvious, but I, I find them actually as a, as a shift in mindset for the facilitator is can we reframe it from antagonism to passion when we see like that person who's just acting out or frustrated or irritable, like maybe that's actually an expression of passion and what does that reframe do for us and how do we get to that point. And secondly is um, finding opportunities to work through the conflict offline, offline, online as well, but in different stages and different configurations. So one-on-ones, group-wide, only those involved. But just because something is happening in that moment, it can be dealt with in their other configurations between all as a group and in the plan program and none as the time that our screen is off and you're back in your family life or home life or whatever else is, is happening. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Great. So, Hani, you asked a great question. Because healthy conflict is so important, what can be done to, dare I say, nurture it online when it doesn't happen? Um, wonderful. So, Hani from the Relational Learning Cohort. Hello. Um, so, that's a great question about how do we actually, you know, help it emerge. And again, I, I, I think it's by asking the the right questions by um, sh making space for passion to emerge. Um, for giving uh, a, a, an opportunity for a role um, that the learners can play where they're able to, sh to express their individuality um, and assume, name, but also assume that um, multiple people's expressions of individuality will by definition stir a storm. <laughs> like that's just the more people are able to be their authentic selves and therefore, um, there are even great Jake, there are, there are different mediums that can help bring it out. Um, but all of this in the norming process, meaning in the forming, which we'll come back to in the norming in a minute, but just creating the conditions for it will um, hopefully be able to elicit it. Haley, let's move on to norming. The next slide. So norming, what happens over here is after things have been nuts and started to calm down a little bit, or at least the facilitator has said, like, it is now time for me to <laughs> rein the ship in and we've got to do something about it. Um, this is where the group starts to, um, to get the rules of behavior. There are, there are the right rules that are going to the group and everything is spelled out. This is what we need to do moving forward. Back to our master chef example from the beginning, like, all right, we have 10 minutes left. You're on this line, you're doing this, I'm taking this over, like very clear. This is what we're doing in order to move forward, spelling everything out again. It's often revisiting what happened in the forming stage, but much clearer, much more succinct, succinct, much more directed of like, these are our norms moving forward. Um, and then what usually happens from that is it's like so cathartic and so welcome, <laughs> craved from the group that they're like, thank you, we needed this. It was so bad before. And therefore um, the, the period of cohesion and cooperation begin to appear. Um, I like to take, you know, while well, Tuckman writes a lot about how norming happens, there's actually, um, the work that Jack Gibb, Jack Gibb did at around that same time, um, late 60s, early 70s, was um, a lot about 
his Tory method, which had, it's called Tory T-O-R-I, which stands for trust, openness, realization, interdependence. And it's all different things that have to do with positive group formation as well, a group that's trusting and interdependent and yada, yada. Um, and one of the things he talks about is that there's a relationship between fear and between trust. And this is often the most, um, this is at the core of the storming and trying to navigate the um, forming stages very earlier on, that after the storm is, occurring or you know once it's behind us or enough of it we're ready to work through it naming the main challenge to work through as one of cultivating trust and moving away from fear becomes a very helpful frame um, and what i particularly like about Gid's description is he doesn't just say trust and create a trusting environment but actually breaks down what and to whom do we need to trust and for that i'd like to ask jake if you're able to read um, those four lines about trust Trust creates the flow and gentles the mind, body, spirit. When I trust myself, I am able to enter fully into the process of discovering and creating who I am. When I trust my own inner processes, I am able to become what I am meant to become. When I trust you, I am able to allow you in. So when we talk about cultivating trust and creating the conditions for that to happen, among it's what Gibb is describing is I need to trust myself. There's a deeply inter um, introspective process over here of like, how have I been? What have I been doing? Like what, what, who is the me that has been in, present in this group? Um, this trusting my processes, which is like, how did I act? What happened? How did things unfold? Like, did I do the right thing? Did I do the wrong thing? Am I proud of what I did? All of those questions. And then trusting you is trusting the other. Um, and, and it's obviously very relational there as well, but it's, it's not just about me. This is a group and by definition, there's somebody else who's involved. So I need to cultivate that trust. Um, Gib goes on to describe other domains of trust. Like when I trust the process of living and I find that, that could, it's true and maybe it needs to get that broad. These are three that are very relevant to like the specifically group formation process. Um, and I like them as a counter example to, to fear. So um, Hani, would you please read fear, those five lines? Fear, on the other hand, stops the flow and arouses the, de the defenses. I direct my energies not into discovering and creating, but towards protecting myself from seen, expected, or fantasized dangers. I am not sure who I am. I cover up and put on protective masks, become concerned about how I ought to meet the expectation of others and find it difficult to be with others. Okay, so I mean, let that sit. There's <laughs> pretty heavy and there's a lot there. Um, by, by looking at fear in this way, and can fear actually begin to um, uh, justify <laughs> or explain everything that may have happened in the storm itself or even all of the concerns and anxiety in the forming process too of what people were trying to navigate i mean it's it's just constantly present it's not something that we can get away from but actively trying to turn fears into trust or create trust out of fearful moments is one of the key frames that is helpful to facilitate a group through the norming process so how do we do that um hey if you move to the next slide one way to do that is here are a series of just simple questions. They're not simple to answer, but very pointed questions that can help cultivate trust. And what I appreciate about this list is they're written in the individual form, but they can easily be adapted to the group. So what moves me forward is something I'm thinking about, or hey group, what's moving us forward right now? You know, what are we avoiding as a group? What are we not naming? You know, what is that fear that's over there? And, and by, by doing that and articulating it, we can start moving into a more trusting environment. Um, what isn't working for me or for us? How do people see me? How do people see us? This is how I see you. Meaning these come, these are different frames, different lenses that the, the, the elements of trust and fear they surface um, and they surface in a very facilitated way when we're able to ask our learners these questions, either in a one on one or in a group setting or in a small group, you know, working through it. That, 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 that's, that's again a, um, a decision that needs to be made very calculated based on the circumstance of what the, what the norming is in relation to. Um, but this is helping the group get through the storming process and start cultivate trust. Now this, again, you'll get the slides, you'll get these questions, but if you move to the next slide, what this means for us to do online 
um, the different strategies are, number one, address the questions on the previous slide deliberately, like just name them as they are and try and get people to work through them. The more succinct and pointed it is, the more likely that it, it becomes more raw. Um, through a norming process, we're trying to create intimacy by sharing and problem solving, by showing that we're all part of this, that we're able, we're valued to one another, that we've got what to contribute, um, constantly acknowledging individual and group efforts and normalizing fears. Like this is where we need to just, every one of those concerns from the forming stage, at this point, it's not about them, but it's the facilitator to make sure that everyone is valued, is noticed, understands their contribution to this and feels that they're a part of this group process. Ways to do that online, um, uh, without going through all three, because I, I see we're a bit, you know, uh, running low on time, is um, I like the idea about uh, number three, which is just constantly sparks of inspiration. Just trying to um, challenge participants by sharing the challenges that they've overcome, naming things that they'd like to face, but really putting them front and center, putting them in the spotlight and just showing like, look what, like trusting is also this accountability, it's this appreciation, it's this valuing, it's all of that stuff which happens through these little tactics which tend to be more about featuring, letting the group feature itself and being someone just creating the conditions and not coming in and stepping in and saying, all right, we need to work through this, this is how we're moving forward. And for the final slide, um, when we get into performing, if this is what it's all about, and you know, the question is, you know, this is where the group works as a unit, they've accomplished their tasks, their solutions, everything's wonderful, we're in peace and harmony. And like, and I don't say this, you know, only joking, like, it's, it's great when a group is able to get there, it's high functionality, we call it optimal performance. Um, this is, um, the question is number one, did you make it? Like, I would even ask if you, if you quickly in your, um, in the chat box, taking your example into account of your scenario, that your group came together to work on some, like task oriented was one thing, from a scale of one to five, one being absolutely like complete dysfunction and five being we reached optimal performance, we got into a state of flow, like we were able to get there. I'm curious if each person can just write, like the action is like, right, one, two, three, four, five. Um, one being totally low, five being optimal performance. Like what, did your group get through this? Did your group, do you feel like you were able to, um, to, to achieve that state of, of performance? All right, and as they're coming through threes and fours, and there may be some that are like amazing, exactly, five and dead, like there was this one group that was amazing, and we are like, we are still in touch to this day, and there's maybe some ones of like we tried, and we just like dismantled, and that was the end. Um, and I can see a lot, threes and fours seem to be the most prominent. So what flow looks like, and you know, with this we'll wrap up in just two or three minutes, is the best description I have for it is from Csikszentmihalyi's description of his work on flow. Um, and the work on flow is when a group is just, it's a state of mind, um, and then also a course of action where people are just so in it that they get lost in the ecstasy of what's happening because like they know it, they're bought into the process, they're bought into the people, they know their place, like everything about it just works, that it's so, um, it's, it just works. You're like in a good, you're in a good groove, you're in a really good rhythm. Um, and this, this chart on the side is like, what does flow feel like? It's when people are totally involved, it's, there's a sense of timelessness, you lose like a sense of what's going on around you because you're just so excited and motivated by, by the task that is at hand and what you're doing and what the group is doing and what it's all about, that that really is a state of flow. And the final slide um, of this is, well, how do we go ahead and do this? Um, the key tenants to flow that Csikszentmihalyi talks about is constantly, it's not just balancing skill and challenge, like um, what is the skill level of this group and what are they able to achieve and therefore let me create the right challenge for it, but it's constantly pushing them a little bit higher to each other. So it's how do I actually, um, um, knowing my skills, how do I increase that challenge so that it um, is achievable and empowering, but it's also motivating to say, hmm, I wonder if I can do that. And then when they achieve that, then they likely feel that sense of accomplishment. And there's, it's not just spoon feeding, but it's giving them something to work towards. When the challenge is too hard, um, then they burn out because they say, I'm not even going to try and do this. And when it's too simple, they say, I'm not even going to try for this. I'm apathetic. This is stupid. And it's trying to find that optimal level of challenge that knowing your group skill level, you're able to adjust and constantly push them forward. 
Um, and how we do that online is, I find these to be three very important points. Number one, just don't, we, I tend to underestimate the ability to execute online. Like, you know, what is an online space? Can people actually perform? Can they show themselves? Can they work towards something? And the answer is yes. They can work towards something and they can feel tremendous accomplishment from achieving that goal. And that needs, that can't be forgotten. Like the excuse of it's virtual and therefore like, for a minute, remove that and just keep the challenge as the challenge and the task as the task um, and raise the stakes, like raise the stakes, make and incentivize it, create rewards, consequences, all of that. And by doing that, often you're encouraging their preparation offline as well and saying in order to do that on tomorrow's webinar, you might have to pull an all-nighter. I don't know, like you might have to do, like, do it. They'll want to do it by this point because hopefully they're in that groove and they're motivated because they've already gone through that whole norming process. They're in that state of flow, but it needs to be worth their while. And the more we're able to push that, um, I do think that that's feasible online. It's counterintuitive to what the online platform offers us, but there are people behind every screen and the, the, that human tendency will appear. Um, and it will only appear if we give a container for that to happen. So with that, I, I apologize for not giving more space for questions because it kind of rushed through the content. Um, I am happy to entertain any questions that anyone has. Um, anyone who wants to stay online, you're welcome to. Uh, anyone who wants to arrange a time to speak afterwards, totally happy to do that as well. But thank you all. And there you go. Have a good day, everyone. If anyone does have questions, you're welcome to stay on or, or not. Um. Kiva, I'm curious, uh, if I may, just uh, are there studies around like how this maps on the timeline, um, these stages map on the timeline, because sometimes these things can happen, um, it seems like just like that so quickly, sure. or groups have like such a short term period of being together, or um, yeah, just uh, in interesting how... how if you've seen it. So anything. the answer is, is yes. Um, and much of the work, the comparison that I'm going to make um, from storming is to the work that we've done on conflict, where, um, you know, conflict is the driving force in script writing. It's a driving force in storytelling. It's a driving force in film in, in, and in relationships and everything else as well. Using those other mediums as the example, um, if the conflict doesn't emerge within the first, you know, um, 10 minutes of the movie, you're walking out of the movie. And if the conflict doesn't emerge within the, you know, first 30 pages of the book, you're closing the book because it's just not interesting because they're not, the character's not working towards something. And because there's no stakes that are like, it's not there. And therefore the distinction between working through the storm on the one hand, but also trying to create the conditions in the forming stage so that we can get into the meat. And that's usually where storming happens. It's something that has to happen fairly quickly. Um, I, I, I find, um, and this is totally, you know, based on my own impressions, and this is not scientific at all. I find that people live in the forming stage and are afraid to, don't know how. Maybe they're afraid or maybe they don't know how to get outside of it. And therefore what happens is, we suggest our norms and we make sure we're comfortable and we're so excited about something and then we revisit our norms and then we made someone uncomfortable for a minute so then we revisit our norms again and it's and, and it's it's going back to that space so in terms of a timeline i i would say um it needs to happen within the it has to happen quick enough before you lose people's attention I mean, that has to be, it has to be significant enough that it's going to drive, right, Donna? It has to be significant enough that you're going to drive, um, they're going to be motivated to participate. Cool. Thank you. And thank you for the session. You're welcome. Kiva, this is great. I, I asked the question earlier. I'm, I'm still confused because I feel like people storm at different times in my mm -hmm. experience as a group leader and just recently being in SEC 4. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't know how, how, how do you do it with group dynamics? Like, how does it work if everyone's, or, yeah. or do you not feel like that you think that people tend to sort of follow one another? No, it's a completely individual process. It's totally an individual process. When we're looking at this model, the model is keeping the group as the, as the subject. So it's saying, how does a group in its totality move from one of complete strangers who just have no idea who they are or what they, why they're gathering or what this is about to a state of um, cohesion and um, performance and knowing, uh, valuing each other and appreciating the test that's at hand. And that's like a very much a macro model for how to get 
body of individuals and turn them into a cohesive group um, or for them to turn each other into one. There will, it answered in two ways. Number one, um, the process is linear in that forming has to set up the, the stage for storming and yeah, like it needs to go that way. But that doesn't mean that once you've got to performing, you're not going back into the storm. <laughs> or it doesn't mean that like, and I would encourage you to think about those moments at SEC, if that's gonna be your example of like, when you found yourself back in those icky moments, was it because um, you, you you were there and you, you hadn't worked through it? Or had there been elements of a normalizing you no know, process where either through working with a coach or working with a home pod or, you know, different things were starting to create the conditions that that supported that trust. But then in the broader group context, and, and maybe in that smaller group configuration, like a home pod, for those who don't know, a home pod is 10 people of a 40 person cohort, where it's a much more intimate space. Maybe for that, you're like, this group is really performing. But the group of 40, I kind of perceive as a different group going through a totally different group formation process. And, and I would push you to think for yourself, when, when you're, is it you in that same process going back and forth between stages, or is it you in the same program that actually had different group configurations, each one developing at different stages? Um, and think about that. And recognizing when you're performing, you can totally go back to the storm. <laughs> it's easier to get out of it and it's easier to work through because there's more of an appreciation for it, but that happens afterwards. Thank you so much. So nice to see all of you. Have a good day. Thank you, Tova. Good to see you. Bye, honey. Hi, Becky.